Good evening, Matthew Road. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? All right. Yeah, we're studying through the book of Acts, right? I got that right? Okay. And find that God is active in the church 2,000 years ago and still today. So let's stand and let's praise him.
Thank you, Lord, that we have victory because of your victory over sin and death in the grave. Lord, may we please you with our lives. May we please you with our words. And God, tonight, may you speak to us through your word, Lord, that we may be encouraged about your work in your church, about your work in our lives. God, that we would love you more tomorrow than we do today, that we'd, we would serve you more wholeheartedly tomorrow than we do today. And God, that we look forward to that day when we'll see you face to face in all of your glory. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Hey everyone, it's Josh, the media director here at Matthew Road. Thanks so much for joining us for worship today. Summer is here and we've got a lot planned that's coming up. All right, get ready kids and parents. Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. In this week of twists and turns, we'll be learning about how following Jesus changes the game. So get your game faces on and come ready to play. There's still time to register online if you haven't yet, so head on over to our website at matthewroad.org forward slash VBS and fill out that form. And since our kids are going to be all over campus this week, our Chance to Relate ministry will be joining Cross Point Church this Tuesday instead of meeting in Common Grounds. As usual, the meeting time will be from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. So just remember, if you show up here, you just might have some kids challenge you to a heated game of trouble instead. Also, our Wednesdays will look a little different this summer, starting June 14th. For kids, we've got Wacky Wednesdays. On top of a Bible study every week, we'll have water games and popsicles for kids kindergarten through sixth grade. So come with your towels and some clothes that you can get wet in from 6.30 p.m. all the way till 8, all summer long. Now for our adult Bible studies, we haven't forgotten about you either. Every Wednesday night, starting at 6.45 p.m., we will be watching an episode from The Chosen Season 2. After the episode's over, we'll break off into discussion groups and just go over the events in Jesus' life that were covered in that episode. And finally, we've got a business meeting planned for next Sunday. So that's June 11th, right after the 11 o'clock service. All church members are welcome and encouraged to attend this meeting. Please grab an announcement flyer in the lobby to see more of our events for the summer. You can find Bible studies that meet during the weekdays, and you can also see the church's financial numbers, as well as a QR code for the giving page on our website. If you'd like to give, scan the QR code on screen, or just head over to our website and click the Give option at the top of the page. You can give online, or you can give in person by using a giving envelope from the chair back pocket. And if you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for visiting Matthew Road. We're so happy to be worshiping with you today. We would love to share more about Matthew Road with you, so if you would, please fill out a Connect card from the seat back pocket in front of you so we can get you connected for ministry and fellowship. On the other side of the Connect card, there's some space for your prayer requests. We would love to be praying for you this week, so if you have anything you'd like prayer for, please fill that out and leave it in an offering box on your way out today. Thanks again, and God bless you as we continue to worship our Lord together. Good evening. How are we doing? Good, good, good. All right, so we're finishing up Acts chapter 6 tonight. Last week we looked at the seven who were chosen to serve, and this week we'll be kind of examining just the ministry of Stephen and uh, I'm sure Stephen is a familiar, a familiar name. Uh, if you have you know, gone through the book of Acts, then you'll recognize Stephen's name. He's the first Christian martyr, first one killed for his faith. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Stephen, we don't really have much about his ministry. We have a handful of descriptive words, and we're going to look into those, but we don't have too much. So Tonight, the, the challenge before us in this, in this text is to kind of understand in seven verses, Acts 6, 8 through 15, the ministry of Stephen that led to the events that would, would you know, end up as his martyrdom, lead up to the trial in front of the Sanhedrin. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. So for me, Stephen has always been a hero of the faith for me. Uh, when I was 13 years old, is that rain? 
Wow, that's loud. All right. Cool. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I have ADHD, so what are you going to do? Uh, uh, anyways, um, Stephen's always been a hero of the faith for me. When I was 13 years old, I first started to sense that God might be calling me to ministry, and I expressed that to youth leaders and was encouraged to read the book of Acts and to read the pastoral epistles and just kind of work through that. And so I did, and when I came up to Acts 7 and I read Stephen's, Stephen's story, I, I have to admit, as a 13-year-old, Stephen stood out because I thought his, the way that he died was really cool. I was like, man, that's awesome. Like he, like, he is cool. Like, I'm a big fan of Stephen because his death is really, really something, you know? He, he asked God to forgive the people who were killing him. I think that's a powerful testimony uh, and his understanding of forgiveness. Uh, God has shown him uh, that he would cry out to God for the forgiveness of those who are killing him. And then you also have this scene where he sees Jesus. He tells the people who are stoning him, like, look, I see I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, right? It's like, it's an amazing, amazing story of, uh, of this, this martyrdom. And so he always stood out to me for that. But as I, I kind of have always uh, then, because of that, read through Acts 6 and 7 and kind of, you know, you pause a little bit with the selection of the seven and then you kind of skip ahead to his martyrdom and you like, you, you know, you read his, his uh, sermon, speech, response, defense, whatever you want to call it here that comes up next. Um, it, could have, it could literally be any of those things. Uh, he, you, you kind of skip through that all the way to the, to the point where he's martyred. Uh, to, this week as I'm studying this, I was really struck by the life of Stephen. And you know, he's a hero of the faith for me because I think that the way that he died is very faithful. And I hope that I have my faith in Christ as strong as Stephen up to the point of death. And then obviously when, it, when I gain, my faith gains sight, when I see Jesus face to face. But as I was studying Stephen's life a little bit and, and this ministry that he lived out, I was really impressed by Stephen. And last week, like I said, we talked about the choosing of the seven. And with that, we kind of also talked about the qualifications that, that the apostles gave when they chose the seven. So remember they said that they wanted seven men who were full of or good reputation, full of wisdom, and full of the Spirit, okay? And so we had the qualifications. And, you know, I was, uh, I was interested by this, the qualifications. And, and now looking at Stephen's life, yes, he met the qualifications and was chosen to serve. And so he did. He served in the ministry of, of, of giving the, uh, the widows the daily distribution and those types of things for the Hellenistic Jews. But his ministry went so far beyond that. He didn't just, he didn't just serve food. Uh, just like the apostles didn't just preach, they also taught and they trained and all those things he, they equipped. Uh, so Stephen's, Stephen's own ministry went beyond what he was you know, given the title of. And I think it goes beyond that because Stephen, the man, was qualified beyond what the qualifications required. And he was qualified beyond what the qualifications required, so full of wisdom, good reputation, full, full of the Spirit, because of his deep faith in Christ, okay? And I just want to make an important note real quick as we get started with this. You know, when you're looking at the qualifications for ministry, for, for church leaders, for pastors and elders and deacons, as you go to the pastoral epistles, you read First Timothy and Titus, and you see these really, really, you know, it seems like, like very specific lists of what's required for, for someone to be qualified for the work of ministry, uh, it's important that we don't stop with those qualifications. Those qualifications should actually uh, really define everyone who's given their life to Christ. They have to be present for somebody who is serving in ministry because it's such a public role. You represent the name of Jesus so publicly, so you have to fulfill those qualifications from that public office of ministry. But you can't just expect that a person, because they can say on paper that they meet the qualifications, is going to be a faithful minister of the Word of God, okay? And so to kind of think through this a little bit, today I did something that I haven't done yet. Has anybody here messed with um, like chat GPT and AI and that kind of thing? You messed with it a little bit? It's kind of fun, okay? I had not up until today. Uh, but what I did was I went to this, this AI website where you can give it a prompt and then it will give you, it'll spit back at you whatever you ask for, okay? And so I asked the AI for a job description for a lead pastor in a Southern Baptist Convention church. Oh my God. I wanted to see what it would do, you know? Right. And, and I, here, I've, I've brought the results here, if you can read that. 
It, let me just tell like, look, if you go, okay, so I took this chat GPT thing, this, uh, this you know, AI, and then I, you Google job descriptions for, you know, open pastor jobs or whatever, and you can click through to read the job descriptions. This thing sounds like better written than most of them, okay? Uh, but you have the position overview, the primary spiritual shepherd. It says these words that, you know, a, a church search committee would use, I would think. Uh, then you have the responsibilities. He has to be able to preach and teach, provide spiritual leadership, pastoral care, and uh, has to be able to cast vision and uh, also has to work in administration. These are all things that you would expect to see on an actual job description for a pastor, right? Uh, he has qualifications. It's important. Committed to Southern, committed Southern Baptist believer. I'm a committed Christ follower, but uh, I mean, Southern Baptist believer. Oh, that sounds a little weird, but whatever. Uh, fully embracing the core beliefs. Okay, ordained, eligible for, okay. All these things. Like this sounds like, honestly, it sounds really good. Okay, and here's the thing. This was made up by a robot in like five seconds. It was, it was mind-boggling. This, this really pretty accurate job description was made up by a robot in about five seconds flat. I looked at Audrey, I was like, oh, this is kind of weird. Like, <laughs> I, I, I never used this. It was like, whoa, that was kind of shocking. Look, my point is, you can come up with a job description. You can come up with qualifications. It didn't mention First Timothy or Titus, by the way, for uh, qualifications. But uh, you can come up with these things. Scripture gives us a great outline for qualifications. But the question for the person who's called to ministry, the person who's called to serve, is, is your life reflective of being an ambassador of Christ? Do you reflect Jesus Christ every day? Do you love Jesus Christ supremely above all else? And that is your motivation to serve, to uh, share the gospel, to defend the faith, to do all these things, okay? So you can have whatever qualifications you want. You can meet whatever qualifications you want. There are people who are extremely qualified who would probably flounder in ministry because their motivation is not grounded in a love for Jesus Christ. And then because of that, a love for others as well. Stephen exemplifies a person who was called to ministry and loves Jesus Christ, okay? And I want to look at his life tonight, and so let's get into that a little bit. We're reading Acts 6, 8 through 15. It says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with, with, with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against the, this holy place, the temple and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting on the council saw his face like the face of an angel. All right. So, I'm going to give an example in the life of Stephen. I think we're given an example of the faithful life in Christ Jesus. So examining the ministry of Stephen, like I said, is a little bit challenging because we don't have much to work with. We have this, these seven verses and then Acts chapter seven. And from that, we need to be able to deduce what led to this trial and eventual, uh, eventually his, his murder, right? And so this is what we see with Stephen. One, uh, one way that we live like Christ is by being faithful in ministry. And I, I don't want to limit this to ministers. Um, I think it's true for ministers, but it's also true for all believers in Christ Jesus. Maybe faithful service would be a better way to say this. But here we go, Stephen's uh, example in ministry. So I have verses three and five there because again, the way that the apostles gave the qualifications was that a person had to be of good reputation, full of, full of the spirit and full of wisdom. So we know then because he was chosen and appointed by the church that Stephen was those things, good reputation, full of the spirit, full of wisdom. And then in verse five, when it says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. So he's full of faith also. Okay. So wisdom, faith, the spirit, 
uh, and then faith and the Holy Spirit, okay? And then we're gonna go ahead over here to verse eight where we are tonight. And it says that he's also full of grace and power. Okay, so Stephen, every time Luke like, describes Stephen, he uses some really cool descriptive words, words that he was full of grace and power and he was doing these things. It's really amazing. So his example in ministry is one to follow. And again, it's not because of Stephen himself. It's because of Christ who Stephen loved, right? That it was the, the fact that he served Jesus and that Jesus was able to, to then work in his life in these powerful ways. So Stephen was full of grace and power. He's performing great wonders and signs. This is part of his ministry. Again, he went beyond just serving the food of the daily distribution. Uh, Stephen, uh, doing these great wonders and signs, these are the same words used to describe the, uh, the works of the apostles, the same words used to describe the works of Christ, uh, because again, this is the same God at work. The same God at work in, in the apostles is now the same God at work in Stephen himself. And so he's performing these wonders and signs. There's some question, did he do the wonders and signs before the apostles laid their hands on him or was this some sort of gifting that the apostles gave him when they laid their hands on him? Uh, I think that we see pretty clearly that Stephen was full of the spirit before the apostles ever touched him. And so I think that Stephen was being used by God powerfully and mightily before this, which actually led to the church verifying that, validating that and appointing him for service, okay? So the, um, we're gonna dismiss that question and move on. Uh, so Stephen, his example in ministry, uh, his life in ministry and teaching are all motivated by being Christ ambassador. And I say that because you see, again, the way that Luke describes him, I, I, again, Luke, Luke wasn't there. So for Luke to describe him with these, with these words, that he was full of the spirit, that he was full of faith, that he was full of grace and power, these powerful, powerful descriptive words, for Luke to use those words about Stephen, I think that it's not a stretch to say that his fire for Christ was really obvious to see for, from everyone. It was really, really obvious to see. And so the way that he ministered, the way that he loved, the way that he taught was motivated from a deep love for Jesus Christ and a deep faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, so we also see in the example of Stephen's ministry that God's gonna use people who aren't the apostles in ministry, or not the 12, right? Because uh, eventually Paul is used mightily by God, obviously. And then throughout church history, and even still today, God uses individuals uh, to do his work and to do his ministry. So the ministry of the early church is not limited to the apostles. That's a really good thing. Uh, we are also called to live in submission to Christ the same way that Stephen did. So Stephen, he lived in submission to Christ. And I, I, what I mean by that is he lived his life according to the spirit of God, right? He let the spirit of God lead him and that was obvious to, to people, right? He was led by the spirit. He was full of the spirit. And so he was then appointed to serve in ministry, okay? All of these things that are true of Stephen can and should be true of you and me as well. Okay, because of the God Stephen served and the God that we serve. They're one and the same, the same God. Same God, same living Christ who's at work in the life of Stephen is at work in the life of you and I today if you've put faith in Jesus. And only a deep faith in Christ. That's, this is the only way that you can have a faithful ministry, faithful life of uh, serving Christ, whether it be in, again, vocational ministry or ministry in the church as a faithful follower of Christ, the only way that you're going to sustain this life of, of living for Christ, being Christ's ambassador, is if you have a deep faith in Christ Jesus, the person of Jesus Christ. Stephen was convinced, it's obvious by his life, he was convinced that Christ truly was the Messiah and that because of that, he saved him from his sins. And that's why Stephen lived the way that he did. That's why he reasoned with these uh, other Jewish people to try to convince them of the same truth that he had come to know. It's because of his deep faith in Christ. Only a deep faith in Christ can sustain us in a life of ministry. So there's, that's, that's one thing that you kind of see from, from Stephen. Um, is that the other thing I, I didn't even mention is in verse 10, uh, when he has this debate with these people, they're unable to cope with him in his wisdom and the spirit that he spoke with, uh, or the spirit that I guess was speaking through him, you could even say. It was, it's, it's, just, it's a powerful example of the life lived for Christ Jesus that in the face of this you know, opposition and things like that, that he was able to speak with such wisdom uh, and grace as well. All right? So, number one, live like Christ. Uh, you, you do that by living a life with, filled with faithful ministry, okay? The second thing 
is that we live like Christ when we're faced with opposition. So something that you see in Stephen is true and it's repeated throughout scripture that the reality of persecution is there, okay? If you live a faithful life in Christ Jesus, then you can expect persecution. This is what Jesus said in John 15. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus said like, they hated me first, okay? So if you love me, then they will hate you too. Uh, And then Paul, way later in his ministry, said... Indeed, all who want to live a godly way, that's a weird translation in the NASB 2020, but um, indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So we can expect persecution. We can expect persecution for living a godly life. Stephen lived a godly life and faced persecution. It's not surprising. It's not surprising. It's also, uh, it's, it's also not surprising that he was chosen to serve and that he, was then, he then faced persecution and that he was faithful through that persecution all the way through it because that is the type of person who's called to serve in, uh, in ministry. That's the type of person who's called to follow Christ, really. All right, so um, the other thing here that we have to get into with Stephen and his facing persecution um, or facing opposition is let's look at his opponents for a second, the people who wanted him shut down. It says, some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia. They're the ones that rose up against him. And so, okay, what is the synagogue of the freedmen? Well, basically, uh, these, the, the word freedmen is, uh, means that the, these were people that were, were once slaves and then were free, or that they were the descendants of people who were once slaves and then were free, okay? So they're freedmen. So they're Hellenistic Jews that had moved into Jerusalem. All right, so a little bit of history that I found out as I was studying this is that in 60 BC, Pompey went to Jerusalem, Roman, uh, Roman emperor went through Jerusalem, and took some Jewish people with him as slaves to work uh, in the Roman, Roman world. Uh, they were evidently really bad slaves for him because they were really, really faithful to the law. They were really rigid with, the, uh, with their diet, and they were also really rigid with following the Sabbath. And because of that, he released a lot of them. And so a lot of people moved back to Jerusalem, and so they had some Roman back or Greek culture background, uh, and then other people went to other parts of, Roman, of the Roman world and lived there. So this synagogue of freedmen was, was created by individuals who were probably released then by Pompey and gone back to Jerusalem, and they had this Greek language where everybody else was speaking Aramaic, and so they formed their own synagogue so that they could get together and study the scripture, okay? So that's kind of the this, this synagogue. So um, all of these, these different people who are mentioned here, uh, different places who are mentioned here, there's only one that I really want to point out, and it's Cilicia. And the reason that that's important is because Cilicia is a small place in Southeast Asia, and it's the capital city there is Tarsus. Can anybody think of a person who came from Tarsus? Saul. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Saul. Uh, later known as Paul, came from Tarsus. So you guys question, was Saul a part of the synagogue? Obviously, he was there at the presence of Stephen's martyrdom. We're going to read about that in a couple weeks. He fully agreed with it. So you have to wonder, was he at this synagogue also and one of these people who opposed Stephen and his teaching? Maybe. I mean, it's, it's maybe. There's no way of knowing. Maybe so. Um, there's some his, histories that say that uh, Gamaliel, who Paul learned under, he taught at the synagogue. So, like, we, we really don't know uh, whether or not Paul was a part of this or not, whether or not he knew Stephen prior to the trial before the council or not. But uh, nonetheless, this group who, who worshipped, because they were Hellenistic Jews who had traveled back to Jerusalem, you have to understand, these were extremely devout Jewish people. They followed the law very rigidly. They, followed, they believed, the, like, they, they loved the temple. Uh, they had a great love for the temple and the things of God and all those types of things. So they were very, very, very devout Jewish people. And so they were really zealous. So when Stephen came in and, and uh, evidently was teaching about Christ, uh, then they have this... It's kind of, it kind of indicates like maybe even a formal debate. Um, they rose up and argued with Stephen. It might be some sort of formal, like, like they actually debated one another. Uh, and the idea uh, would be that Stephen, in this debate, maybe formal argument, was 
he, you know, he left them speechless, right? Dumbfounded. They couldn't respond. Uh, and it's, it's, really, it's, it's just really cool that this is how Stephen kind of, uh, this is part of his ministry was that these individuals were so faithful and devoted uh, to what they thought was right. And Stephen says, but you're missing out on the grace that's in Jesus Christ. And so what was the nature of the debate? Who knows? It, it probably or could have been the Messiahship of Jesus. Like, was he truly the Messiah? Is he truly the Messiah? Uh, and so Stephen uh, could have been arguing that. At any rate, we know that he mentioned things about Moses and he mentioned things about the temple because of what we see next. So, um, so these are Stephen's opponents. And uh, one other thing about Stephen in this example uh, that we see in, in verse 10 that says that they were unable to cope with the wisdom, it's some, kind of a fulfillment of something that Jesus had promised in Luke chapter 12 and Luke chapter 21. Where Jesus said, now when they bring you before the synagogues and the officials and the authorities do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So Stephen would be kind of an example of that, a person who went and argued and the Holy Spirit, because it says in verse 10, uh, they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit. The NASB capitalizes spirit here, and I think rightly so. I think that this is the Holy Spirit speaking through him. Uh, so you have that, and then you have Luke 21 as well, uh, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, turning you over to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before the kings and governors on the account of my name. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony, so make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. I love that, because it doesn't make any sense, right? It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony, but don't, don't prepare for it. <laughs> but don't, yeah, you know. Uh, for I, Jesus says, for I will provide you eloquence and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to oppose or refute. Very clearly uh, displayed here when they were unable to cope with what, with what Stephen was saying. It's also in interesting because Jesus was saying these things to his disciples. So it shows us that what Jesus said to his disciples in this moment is true for people beyond his disciples as well. I think people who are Christ followers, that would include us also. Obviously, the it included Stephen. So, so you have a fulfillment of, of this going on here, the fulfillment of these things that Jesus had promised and the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. And then uh, what I want to show you real quick with the life of Stephen that I think is just really, really important. I, I keep saying the same thing on these, these things, which is live like Christ, live like Christ. Stephen lived like Christ. And, and one thing that, that really struck me as I was studying this passage is that Stephen's trial and persecution looks a lot like the trial and persecution of Jesus. So there are some similarities, okay? Some similarities. One, they both left their opponents speechless. They were also both accused by false witnesses. In fact, Jesus is accused by false witnesses who couldn't get their story straight. Remember that? The Sanhedrin is like, no, get me someone else. Someone who can make more sense. Uh, with, with Stephen, they were more um, organized in their efforts. Okay? Uh, they were both accused of blasphemy. Both accused of speaking about destru the destruction of the temple. So this is interesting because w why would Stephen have mentioned this? Well, in the trials of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels, this is thrown up as the accusation of Jesus, that he said he would destroy the temple, but he never says that in the Synoptic Gospel, so it's really confusing. If you go to John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus says, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. He obviously, John actually explains, he was speaking about his own body. He wasn't speaking about the physical temple. Um, so what was Stephen saying about the temple? I think probably, if you go to Acts 7, 48, during the middle of Stephen's long speech, long sermon, um, he says, however, the Most High does not dwell in the houses made by human hands. So I think maybe something like that is what Stephen was arguing. God's too great to live in anything that we make, right? And Solomon even said so whenever he was praying to, like, thanking God for letting him build the temple. He said, like, I know that nothing here can even contain you, right? Right? And so this, this idea is not, it shouldn't have been really a surprising idea, but uh, nonetheless, you know, this, this idea of destroying the temple would have been a huge deal, and it also, uh, it would have been a huge deal because actually under Roman law, it was illegal to destroy or even really talk about destroying a holy place, so uh, a, a building of worship, okay? So this accusation 
Well, it's not true in either case, in the case of Jesus or in Stephen. It was thrown against them because it's such a weighty claim that they would talk about destroying the temple. He also, he also has this in here that, you know, that he was saying that Jesus was going to alter the laws of Moses. And I have Matthew 5, 17, and 19, 5, 17 through 19 there because Jesus says that he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the law of Moses. He came to perfectly explain and reveal the law of Moses. He didn't come to destroy it. Uh, it's not even altered. It's now read, uh, read in the true light of Christ. Okay, uh, so you have that. Uh, they also faced a stirred up group on each level of the religious hierarchy. And so this is the first time in the book of Acts that it says that the people were against Stephen or against Christianity. Up to this point, the only people who had opposed Christians were the Jewish leaders. It wasn't, you know, a statewide hatred against Christians at that point. Up until now, when these individuals from the synagogue of freedmen, very devout, very zealous, went and stirred up people to, uh, to, to falsely accuse Stephen. And it says in verse 12, they stirred up the people, the elders, and the scribes. So common people, the elders, uh, the, so the, the Sadducees, and the scribes, the Pharisees. Like all of these groups of people now wanted Stephen dead because he's now accused of blasphemy. Widespread, okay? Uh, obviously Jesus faced a, an angry crowd as well. A whole mob came to carry him away. They were also both brought before the Sanhedrin and asked to defend themselves. Um, and so, yeah, there's just a lot of similarities between the, the persecution of Stephen and the persecution of Christ. And, and it's just, I, again, I just want to use Stephen as the example here. Living a faithful life in Christ will lead to persecution. Stephen's life didn't have to look like he followed Jesus, but it did. And because of that, because he did follow Jesus, because he faithfully believed and loved the Lord, he also faced persecution. And I think it's, it's not un, unintentional that his persecution looked very similar to Jesus's as well. All right. Um, the last thing that I want to look at is living like Christ, living like Christ uh, for the sake of others. Okay. So living like Christ, having a faithful life of ministry and service, um, living like Christ when you're opposed, and then doing this because of the work of Christ in your life and what that produces within you should be a love for others as well. So for the sake of others. And so Stephen, so getting all the way down here to verse 15, uh, they've accused him of, of talking about destroying the temple, talking about altering the law of Moses. And now in verse 15 it says, And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting on the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Stephen had the face of an angel in the face of persecution. And I think that's a pretty powerful Thing, right? Like, obviously, it was profound to the people who were on the Sanhedrin, on the council, um, that his, you, I mean, you can imagine, right? What does it mean to have the face of an angel? Well, it's probably not that he looked like a chubby little baby, right? <laughs> like, that's not what it means. Uh, I think that it means that he uh, could have meant, actually, that he looked terrifying to them. Who knows? But I think that probably really what's being said is that it, to them, they could see that he had the peace of God. He looked like a man who had been with God uh, and that that was obvious to them. His relationship with God would be unquestionable. I think the, the effect on those who witnessed this had to be powerful, so I think, I'm thinking through this, how does Luke know that the Sanhedrin looked at him and said, like all thought the same thing, which is that's the face of an angel, other than an eyewitness probably on that council who saw that. Um, and I think maybe it's probably the Apostle Paul who would say this. So can you imagine, can you imagine Paul going through his experience with Luke as Luke's writing his history and just tearfully explaining the martyrdom of Stephen. Like, like at the time, he felt so justified, right? Paul saw, felt so justified being on this council, putting Stephen to death. He's a blasphemer. Uh, he's trying to, you know, he's, he's trying to spread this heresy. And then looking back after his life had been changed so profoundly by Jesus, just tearfully thinking through what he saw when he saw Stephen. So I mentioned Stephen's a hero of the faith for me. I am going to make the claim, I think that Stephen is also a hero of the faith for Paul. I think that, that Stephen's death had a profound impact on Paul's life. 
And I don't mean that in the way that people have taken this, these, the people who have psychoanalyzed Paul and they say, well, Paul actually never really believed in Jesus. He just was overcome with an, an immense guilt because of what happened with Stephen and that what led his whole life. It's like there's, there's no way that his whole life was changed that way and that he faced the persecution that he faced because of some you know, human guilt, right? Um, however... I do think in the light of what Christ did in Paul's life, he was able to look back on things that happened and the people that he encountered and even the people that he persecuted and see the work of Christ in their life as well. So I think that, that the work of Stephen, the ministry of Stephen, even in his death at the hands of Saul, Paul, had a huge and profound impact on him uh, in his life and in his ministry beyond. And, and I, I was, I've been kind of studying the, the pastoral epistles and in 2 Timothy, Paul has, he said a couple things to, to Timothy. Remember, this is the end of Paul's life, 2 Timothy is. The, at the very end of his life, he says a few things that I think, I'm not saying this is definitely from Stephen, but the example of people like Stephen, faithful people like Stephen, and also his own life as he looked back on his own life in ministry. In verse 10, he says, for, the, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Paul's willingness to uh, take on suffering and face persecution and face imprisonment and face beatings. And at this point in his life, he's looking out, he's looking forward, and he says, I'm facing imminent death. The reason that I'm, that I'm willing to do that is for those who are chosen to be Christ's, I'm willing to risk my life. I'm willing to lose my life if it means that they get to know Jesus. I think Stephen, I think Stephen lived the same way. He was willing to risk his life. He was willing to lose his life if it meant that those he was fighting, that he was opposed by, that it meant that any of them got to know Jesus as well. And Stephen wasn't mad when Paul got to heaven. Stephen cried out for Jesus to forgive Paul and the rest of those there who were throwing stones with the intent to kill him. That's only possible if your life has been changed by Jesus Christ. You don't harbor uh, resentment and hate in your heart if you've been changed by Jesus Christ. You want other people to experience the same forgiveness and grace and mercy that you've experienced yourself. And this is, this is, this is, like, this is Stephen's life. And so I think that his, his death had a really, really, really profound impact on everybody who was there, especially the people throwing the rocks. So see, he's a hero of the faith. That, I, that is true. I think Stephen's a hero of the faith. But it's not because Stephen's great. It's not because he had some amazing will to face, you know, an angry mob. It's because he gave his life to Jesus Christ he had faith in Jesus Christ and he let Christ work through his life to minister to others and lead others to the glory that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So, to wrap up, I just want to encourage us because we're all faced kind of with a question as you look at this life of Stephen and other people like him in Scripture who are faithful. And then not only in Scripture, but read like Fox's Book of Martyrs and read the, the, the way that people have given their lives to Christ um, are giving their lives for the name of Christ. Um, we are kind of struck with a question. It's, it's, I want to frame it like this. Stephen, he's an example of the grace-filled life that is available only in Christ Jesus. The grace that can sustain us in the life of faith, strengthen us when we face opposition, and grant us endurance when we face persecution. The question that we're faced with in light of the example of Stephen is simple. Have you entered into the same faith that he had? Stephen should only be celebrated because his life points, to, uh, points us closer to Jesus. Each of us, each of our lives should do the exact same thing. So Stephen, I, I, again, examining his ministry, his ministry is profound, I think. It was probably short. It was profound. It was, it was solid. It was used by God to, to bring people to Christ. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but his life is only that because of the person who saved him, which is Jesus Christ. So Stephen lived his life so that others could see Jesus Christ through his life. Do we do the same thing? 
Do we do the same thing? Stephen had a deep faith in Christ Jesus. He had a deep love for Christ Jesus because of who he knew him to be. Do we have the same faith in Christ Jesus? Do we have the same love for Christ Jesus? So the, the question is, if you have that, that love, if you have faith in Christ Jesus, are you living your life the way that Stephen did, which was so that other people could see Christ in you? Uh, and then if you don't have faith in Christ Jesus, the, the question for you is, in light of people like Stephen, how can you not? <laughs> how can you not? If you don't have a relationship with Christ, I want to invite you tonight, please, please, let's settle that. Put faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, he is the only one who can take you from being whatever you are to a person who's devoted and in love with him and willing to risk your life for him because of who he is. I mean, Stephen, we don't know really anything about his life before Christ, but we can assume he's a Hellenistic Jew living in Jerusalem, probably very devout, probably very zealous even. Uh, something maybe even like what we see in the life of Paul uh, as very zealous, very, you know, very uh, go get him, right, for, for the Jewish faith. And then he gave his life to Christ and it changed everything. He was willing to be killed by his own countrymen because he believed so strongly that Jesus was the Messiah that they needed. So if you haven't given your life to Christ, please, please settle that uh, tonight. I'll be here still for a while, and I'd love to talk with you. love to talk with you about what it means to give your life to Jesus, so please do. But um, let's pray together, uh, and then let's, let's continue on just worshiping Jesus and, uh, through, through praise and song. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example that we have uh, in the faith of, of um, Stephen. Thank you, God, that that's a, a story that you felt important enough to share with us in your word, God, that you saw as, as one that we can uh, take and we can look at and we can say, you know what, Stephen's life looked that way because of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that our lives would look that way because of Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, uh, let our lives be changed every time we look at your word, uh, the mirror of the word. Help us to examine ourselves uh, and follow you more closely. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Stand as we close.